There we go. And so today we are discussing Extreme Championship Wrestling, the impact yes. they had on the wrestling business, and one of the most insane wrestling promotion stories ever told. Yeah, I, I'm happy to talk about this, so I'm very excited. I don't know about you. Yeah, ECW plays a big part of you know my adolescence and in, in, in my maturing into a wannabe goth teenager when I was younger. And so, um, you know, watching, you know, Mantarv and Freddie Joe Floyd, and then like specifically seeing Johnny Polo go to Raven is like, wow, this is what my heart wants to do. I need to, you know, discover who I am and I'm not this circus show over here that, you know, I, I think I'm supposed to be, but, um, I think I've, I know we've talked about uh, before the the timing of the Attitude Era and all of that with our own um, childhood going into our our teenage years and stuff is just like we we had it the best we really did and, and you know what and that speaks of all like even up to today where you're you're seeing a lot of the stuff up to today which uh, the athletes are are younger stronger and and way more athletic than they were back you know, 20, 30 years ago when I first became a fan, you pretty much were like a all in fan as well. So it's like, I'm happy to live all that, you know, but I mean the, uh, that, that, that specific portion of the nineties, you know, when it was mid to late nineties, early two thousands were a special time. And, uh, ECW was very much a part of that. And, um, uh, again, I'm I, I'm happy to talk about it because I mean uh, some of, some of that stuff just played an important role not only in, uh, in our lives but in pro wrestling in general. Yeah. So let's get started. I know, and <laughs> you you had the Monday Night Wars between the two uh, juggernauts, but the third promotion that was secretly under the banner of WWF was ECW, you know, e- Extreme Championship Wrestling. Yeah, and uh, it's funny because uh, Paul Heyman kayfabe the boys on on you know that that little deal, but you know it was often apparent that he hated WCW, and any time he ever got a hold of the WCW talent, it was due to some weird circumstance. It would be like you know Paul would be involved in some sort of lawsuit, and WCW would have to send him a guy or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it would always just be a weird set of circumstances as to why WCW guys were allowed to wrestle in ECW. I mean, technically ECW was one of the biggest indies that there ever was. Cause if that's it, really, when you break it down, that's exactly what it was. It was an independent promotion, but it had a really strong following here in the States and overseas, even, you know, yeah. Japan, Japan specifically. I mean, they were probably the following for ECW was just as big in Japan as it was here in the United States at one point. So, so where do we start to see ECW becoming an indie promotion? So you have Eastern Championship Wrestling, a uh, member of the NWA, and uh, this is right after, uh, maybe you can, let me know if I'm correct, this is right after WCW leaves the NWA as well, like a, a few years after that, we find ourselves in the early 90s. Yeah, um, the, uh, WCW and the NWA parted ways about, I would say, 92-ish. Um, going back beforehand, 89, 90, 91-ish, you had a promotion called the uh, Tri-State Wrestling Alliance, which was run by a guy named Joel Goodhart, who um, was a local, uh, he was a local promoter, and um, Todd Gordon was the money man backing uh, Joel Goodhart. So now, um, and Joel Goodhart was more, more or less a booker, you know, he was promoter slash booker, but he brought in like, um, you know, he was, he was the guy who brought in like, uh, Sheik versus Abdul the Butcher, Owen Hart, uh, one of Owen Hart's first, uh, stateside indie shows that he, that he did, you know what I mean? Like, um, and this was like, uh, 1990, 91 ish. So this was like right before Owen goes back to WWF as the new foundation, Owen Hart. So, yeah. um, and others, um, Cactus and Eddie Gilbert, you know, but he also had a sprinkle of local guys, which ended up in the original ECW, 
which um, was essentially the ashes of the Tri-State Wrestling Alliance and what it turned into because ECW was a very, very, very small independent promotion when it started. Um, and uh, they had Cactus and Eddie Gilbert. Uh, Eddie Gilbert, um, uh, in, in, you know, that was like a fault. That was a really famous uh, tape traded, you know, false count anywhere match. And one of Eddie Gilbert's best, in my opinion. Um, so uh, they had that going for them. And so this was like around 91, 92 ish, where, where um, Todd Gordon really starts getting his shit together and really backing the promotion under his own guys because Joel Goodhart kind of overspent money and um, it kind of just imploded on him. Actually, what the, the coup de grace for uh, Goodhart was he tried booking Ric Flair versus Nature Boy Buddy Rogers, who Buddy Rogers was still alive at the time. And, you know, funny enough, he was Ric Flair's age now, you know, like or pretty close to it. And they were trying to do a Nature Boy versus Nature Boy match, you know, and, and do this big card. And um, that never happened, so because uh, they could never get flair, so they ended up uh, reaching out to Buddy Landell, and he was going to do it. And they they had tickets pre-sold and everything, and you know, fell through. They spent they they spent too, <laughs> they overspent, they overreached, and so that's when Todd Gordon picked it up, and from the Tri-State Wrestling Alliance, because it was more. Uh, Tri-State was Philadelphia, New Jersey, Delaware, I think, were, were like the Tri, or the uh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Delaware, and um, uh, New Jersey. Like, that's what they meant for Tri-State. So, yeah. they were getting <clears throat> guys. And the, and, and the guys that they had in the very, very beginning, what they had a young Stevie Richards, they had a uh, young Sandman, who was Mr. Sandman back then. Or yep. um, this is the Sandman, which was basically a takeoff of the Sting character, except he was like a surfer kind of yeah. character, right? <laughs> Johnny Hot Body. Uh, uh, you had uh, from Rock Dreamland, and Rebel. Dreamland USA, the Dreamboat, Tommy Dreamer. Yeah, yeah, and Tommy didn't come until um, one of the first, uh, like when it was under the ECW banner. Oh, he 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 had first come. So he was a little later than, but, but like Sam Am was like completely an ECW original, for example, um, like the real, real originals, uh, Jason Knight being one of the originals, the sexiest man on earth, you know, during the Todd Gordon regime. And, uh, you know, he didn't become the sexiest man on earth until, uh, Paul Heyman came up with that character, but it was, it was kind of a, com I got it from him. It was kind of a combination of Paul and, uh, uh, Jason being a fan of uh, Rick the Model Martel, so they, it was kind of a playoff of that. Also, yeah. the Euro, the Euro thing was big at the time. You know, see Alex Wright. You know, <laughs> you know the, the European dance, like Ace of Base, like that European dance music was big at the time. So it was kind of like a playoff of a few things, right? Yeah. But he was more an original. Uh, Johnny Grunge, Rock or Rock, uh, the Public Enemy. Uh, you know, were more or less original they were they were like the first characters created under the paul Heyman regime so um uh first modern characters let's just say but it, so, it, I mean, it, it sounds like a real complicated history and it kind of is but really it isn't it was more todd took over in 92 um eddie gilbert was the booker at first it was very 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 small promotion and they you know, Todd and Eddie had the falling out, you know, over God knows what. And then Paul came in because Paul was still Pauly dangerously and managing From WCW. Right. And he was there because um, the, technically it was an indie and Paul was involved in some lawsuit of some kind with WCW over. I'm not sure if it was over discrimination or if it was unfair termination. I'm not sure which. But he was under contract for, or, or he was like not loaned out, but he was he was working kind of underneath. He was an independent contractor who was just working with the promotion that is not in direct competition to WCW. Right, right. Because ECW at that point, I mean, they weren't a threat to anybody. They were just another independent promotion that guys can just go work. It was a little bit different back then. You know, they didn't have. They didn't have these non-complete non-compete clauses or none of that stuff like really existed back then. Or yeah. if it did, guys would break it anyway. So, you know, 
being the outlaws that they were. Yeah. So. And so Tad Gordon, uh, you have Paulie who comes in from WCW and you have yep. Todd Gordon where you said we're around what? 92 about this point. 92. Uh, yeah, Paul completely takes over in 93, September 93, Paul takes over. Um, and uh, I think that was uh, Ultra Clash. Yeah, Ultra, Ca- Ultra Clash 93 was Paul's first show that he, you know, booked completely and mm-hmm. took over. And that's when you had the debut of the Public Enemy. That's when uh, uh, the, the ECW, as we know it, and, and very much that card, it was a misconception because very much that card, was the old tri-state slash Todd Gordon ECW. And it was still very much Eastern, but you mm-hmm. could just tell the little fingerprints of Paul's were, were starting to seep in. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Public Enemy had a lot to do with that because they were the first contemporary tag team created in ECW and the first characters created in ECW. So. All right. So when do we start to see this well who why was the nwa title held up going into the tournament where shane douglas is going to uh very famously throw it down and stick his ecw flag in the ashes of that do you know why the title was held up and who was the champion before then okay so this is kind of a complicated web uh and it had us a lot to do with wcw um, now, uh, Barry Windham was one of the last NWA world champions by name, and uh, he won that in February of 93 against the Great Muda at uh, Super Raw, because at that time, WCW was still very much, you know, within, they were working with the NWA. I guess I can't, okay, so I guess to retract my statement, I can't, I can't fully blame Bill Watts for this, because he had nothing to do with this. This might have been due to the Bischoff regime. When Bischoff first started taking over and didn't really check the fine tooth comb to see that, oh, there were guys in the NWA that still existed, a board of directors, and we have to pay them a licensing fee to use the NWA name. So, of course, what Bischoff does is he drops the NWA name immediately and he turns it into the WCW International title. Now, um now, I do believe Ric Flair, uh, Barry Windham exchanged it with Ric Flair, uh, probably Bash at the Beach, I want to say, 93 that year. He does. And um, there, that, that may have been the last time it was called the NWA title, or they may have just changed it to the international title right before that match. But I know it was like during that time period was when the whole um lawsuit from the nwa down to wcw came and that's when all that that stuff took place and then they had a tournament uh shortly after uh well actually it was vacant for a while until they the lawsuit cleared itself then it was it was months that they they didn't have a, a reigning champion i believe because if this was august like august september time frame of 93 you're talking a year because it was August time frame of 94 is when this uh, um, stuff all happens where NWA, they finally get a hold of the, the world championship. They can use it. They had a rough also, couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Also in the interim, um, uh, Jim Crockett gets gets comes out of retirement and gets involved with ECW on the level where he wants to co-promote with um, – uh, Todd Gordon and Paul Heyman under the NWA umbrella. So Jim Crockett pulls his, hey, I'm I'm a part of the board of directors for NWA, along with Carluzzo and whoever, I maybe Steve Ricard, I'm not sure. But they, you know what I mean? He He pulls his name out of the hat because in reality, Jim Crockett wanted to, he was living in Texas at the time and he wanted to start his own television show and take the NWA champion away from ECW. So yeah. that's when Paul Heyman got a bug up his ass and said, mm, we're not doing that. So <laughs> hence, Paul and Shane get together, and maybe Todd was in on it. Maybe he wasn't in on it. I, I have to know. believe he was. I, had I, to have, I really have to believe he was. It, there had to, it had to have been Paul, Todd, and Shane were the only, and maybe because uh, Scorpio was involved in the match, he had to have known too. But um, like, well, 
But it, it was the committee that had uh, ultimately gave Shane the blessing. And I know that that wasn't without controversy as well. Um, they uh, that Not everybody was on board for Shane to go over in that tournament. Um, but they, uh, I, I believe it was Gordon that finally got the blessing from the championship committee to crown him the new champion, wasn't it? Yes, and I mean, in real in reality, honestly, Shane was their best wrestler that they had on the roster at the time. So, in my opinion, he was the most logical choice to to have be the next guy as far as because Shane, by that point, this was 1994, so he had been in the business for quite a while and had proven himself, and he didn't break through that main event glass ceiling just yet, but he was on the way. So yeah, but he was far from being a curtain jerker too. Yes, yes. I would say for that point in his career, he was like a solid Mick Carter, uh, kind of like in a Jeff Jarrett spot. But but like, you know, but Shane also had a chip on his shoulder where he had a lot to prove because he hated Ric Flair and, yeah, you know, whatever traditions the NWA held. He, he just, you know, because he had been there previous, you know, yeah. for the last few years. So he had known how the politics worked within that NWA system. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking with all the, you know, um, books that I've read about it and all the documentaries that have been put out and then like the hot take YouTube uh, videos on it. It seems like there were these unwritten rules of wrestling that Vince had started to just shit on when he went around and started to, you know, buy up or eliminate territories. And it was that kind of mentality that was really rubbing Shane the wrong way because there are these, these unwritten rules and these committees where it's like, you know, you may be good, but you know, it, it's, it, it almost seems like a Italian mafia family type thing. Like he needed to be made the guy in order to go on and do good. And Shane was being held back by that. And, and by all accounts from anybody who got that NWA title, when it actually meant something, it, it, it really was, you know what yeah. I mean? Yep. So, so we go into uh, I, I also remember that there was some hesitancy to hold the tournament in what would be the, the last uh, card for uh, Eastern Championship Wrestling. Um, and it took a little bit of persuading to uh, get them to agree on chain and hold it um, up there. Was yeah. do you do you recall why there was um, hesitancy to. Uh, kind of go wall in up in the uh, Northeast uh, territory at the time? Well, just uh, the last sentence I told you, because Crockett, unbeknownst to everyone else, except for the handfuls of the handful of talent he told, he supposedly had a television slot down in Texas that he, because he had moved to Texas. This was during the, um, the, the Crockett days where, you know, they moved all their operations to Texas. Jim Crockett pretty much alienated himself from the rest of the Crockett family and ended up settling down and uh, remarried, settled uh, his family down in Texas and stayed after that whole um, uh, that, you know, imploded merger happened, you know, where he yeah. they bought UWF, they bought Florida, they bought St. Louis. And all of a sudden they ran out of money, you know, like the NWA did. And um so so anyways that's a different story for a different time but um uh but yeah uh he had his operations down there and he was he was secretly getting television slots uh he was trying to get television slots together and people interested so that way he can write it have his own television down there and he had um you know everything he was supposedly he had everything in place down there that's why, and and uh, he was trying to basically poach guys to, to come down to, you know, to there, and that would be the base of operations. It seems like the NWA is becoming a sinking ship. Um, it, there was no, really, there was no NWA. I mean, there there was just board of directors at the time. There was no physical NWA at the time, like, meaning, like, this wasn't Jim Crockett Promotions NWA. This wasn't, you know what I mean? This, this wasn't. Uh, an NWA that was under the banner of something else. It wasn't, there was no organization within the NWA. It just existed by name and they happened to have some board of directors back then. And so, so. would it, um, would it be accurate if, you know, Vince goes around um, 
you know, throughout the 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 very early '80s to take the WWWF and later the WWF um, National, and then eventually turn it into a real world brand. And then uh, you have Bischoff and WCW, and so WWF is gone, WCW is gone, and by this mm-hmm. point. I, I, I think you know, what you had said there, there was no more NWA. You know, you have guys that have national TV slots. Now, at, there's there, there's nothing you can do to compete with that in a local, well, unless you're Paul Heyman, but, you know, to compete in a local public access channel. And so there's no reason for them to uh, want to keep on with that tradition. Would that be, is that accurate? Yeah, Paul Heyman wanted nothing to do with that, and he, th- that's been documented. He he wanted nothing to do with that old school tradition at all because he had seen the politics himself just by dealing what he dealt with in WCW and WA before that. So he wanted nothing to do with them and nothing to do with those people at all. Plus, ECW had Paul in place as a booker, you know, one of the one of the greatest bookers of all time. Todd is the money man, and you know, understated, they had syndication deals already with, um, they, they had their show syndicated on the old sports channel. They also had uh, their show syndicated on the Sunshine Network. And then later it would be Madison Square Garden Network. They, they would have it on there. Of course, they had the pay to be on those stations, but they were on there. So yeah. they had television. So it wasn't like they, they had anything to gain by Jim Crockett Promotions being involved with ECW as it existed at that time, you know what I mean? So it's, uh, that was just, and, and it, and actually it was proven right because Jim Crockett never had a television slot. He never had anything down going down in Texas. That was a bluff, you know? Uh, and and, and so think about how the, and think about how the NWA existed afterwards when, cause they, they did another tournament where Candido was crowned the world champion, right? Yeah. Uh, not too long after that. And then, of course, Severn has the stranglehold on the belt. But though, and then later, Mike Rapata gets it. So you're you're talking three guys that were NWA champions, but they had no television. Now Severn was the exception because he did show that bad boy off when he was in the UFC. Yeah. Of course, you know what I mean, and did a lot of Japan tours, so that the belt was visible with Severn. All yeah. fairness, but um, but yeah, but Mike Rapata and Candido. No, there was no NWA, <laughs> you know? Gotcha. All right. So looking at, we have the, the tournament. Shane Douglas uh, is going to go over and has the Don't Globe NWA title. Um, yep. it's, it's been at least a little while before they have had a Don't Globe wearing uh, title where somebody is, is wearing that and going around, you know, representing the NWA. This is going to go to crap. Um, is this the night? Because from a legal perspective, um, I believe Todd Gordon dissolved Eastern Championship Wrestling that night because yep. there is some legal issues where they wanted to take the title back. They wanted to just pretend it never happened, and so he dissolved uh, the LLC, I think, and then created Extreme Championship Wrestling. It's not for everybody. Is this yep. when we have that full turn? Yep. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't hurt that Paul Heyman had a, uh, you know, his dad was a fa- uh, lawyer up in, you know, and he'd always, you know, Paul always had the legal loophole, if you notice. You know what I mean? He always had the loopholes covered for himself. And when they did that, yeah, that was genius because, you know, yes, renaming yourself extreme. They weren't. And by that time, 1994, they were starting to, in the summer of 1994, ECW, the promotion, Eastern Championship Wrestling, was picking up steam. Also, it was starting to become where a place where people were starting to go, meaning like young guys, uh, you know, young talent that that would, uh, you know, come from overseas or whatever. You know what I mean? Like they they were starting to come to ECW. And that was, the, you know, the, by by August, they were starting to, uh, the night the line was crossed was yeah. like where it, the momentum started to pick up because that was that three-way match where it was the one-hour Broadway, basically. Yeah. Uh, but it, really in August, they were really starting to pick up some steam as like being a serious independent promotion within yeah. the United States. 
Yeah, so, and, and I think Shane Douglas doing that is also kind of a message to the younger generation. Like, hey, if you want to come here and put the work in, you can you can go over in this. You know, you're not going to be held back by any uh, backroom politics or any good old boys club. If you want to come here and work, you can be successful. Right. And go to find out. I mean, a lot of that mantra was true. So because ECW, I mean, yeah, this was back still when the boys were getting paid. So, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, when Todd when Todd was the money man, the boys were getting paid. So, yeah, um, we uh, Tim and I did go over uh, the night the line was crossed. Um, he is um, he's he's going through all of the uh, uh, ECW stuff. For us because he's always like I, I have a joke with him that whenever something uh, it's like something that I might like or something we both might like like a band or a movie or something he would always go through and he would put the time in to listen to it to watch it and then I'd show up on the weekend and he would just here I think you'd like this song and that was all I ever had to do he had to he did all the hard work and I just <laughs> um, kind of benefited from there and so he's going through and putting together all of the ECW shows that are going to be significant for us to cover and the night the line was crossed was the first one and it's so weird seeing the Sandman in a wetsuit and then see uh, like that double dog collar match or that three way dance at the end like there's still like a little bit of seasoning of you know the the older traditional stuff but the hard breaking like you know bleeding edge cool wrestling is is just going to explode um going forward really fast well and let's equate it to wwf where you had brett sean you had razor you had the cool characters still but you had underneath you had your man powers you had your Bob Holly, no, no disrespect to Bob Holly, but he was spark plug Holly at the time. The goons, uh, you know, those guys of the war. So for every, I'm saying for every five pieces of talent that were really good in the 90s and people love and fondly remember, there's about 20 other pieces of talent that people were like, huh? Like, yeah. really? In 1996? Really? So, <laughs> so looking at the timeline, um, going on we we're into 95 say yep you have ecw is becoming very extreme a lot of uh japan inspired matches you know barbed wire fire i mean things that no one has seen over here in in a, a large capacity and then looking at the wwf you have the click which I've seen little snippets of like their edginess even back then around this time. How, if you had to compare the two, which one did they ever kind of cross over where ECW was influencing the mainstream wrestling and the click was keeping WWF current with that edginess? Um, where, where do you see any, any crossover in, uh, what influence uh, during this time do EC, does ECW have on the click or vice versa? Uh, from all accounts, nothing. Uh, only because the click were basically, the, the, all they were doing was, um, like later when it became Degeneration X, all they were doing was just being the, the, their smart ass selves. They were just, you know, what they were backstage was what they were being on television, finally, with the volume turned way up. So that's why uh, that original Sean and Hunter group worked really, really well, because that's really what they were at the time, you know, um, or why Hall and Nash, you know, flat, flash forward, go to WCW 96 and do what they do. Uh, that that was them. That wasn't that had nothing to do with ECW. That yeah. That part had nothing to do with it. But what very much did have something to do with ECW, especially in 1995, was the influx of you had your real wrestlers come in, your Malenkos, your Guerreros, your Memois come in. Sabu was already there. Now, Sabu, uh, a couple of times back and forth between WWF and WCW, always had some offers going on. But, of course, those big promotions will always lowball Sabu 
for what he actually was worth and didn't actually look at Sabu, the wrestler. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they saw all the, the other shit and they didn't see like Sabu, the actual like performer wrestler. You know what I mean? Like they saw the stuntman Sabu. Yeah. Um, whereas when the, you know, the Guerrero, uh, Malenko and Benoit get signed, you know, to WCW, they were just uh, basically they were doing the same thing. They were doing an ECW. Yeah. Now they're on a national stage when they got the Nitro. And now the whole world saw them as opposed to just, you know, a niche audience in Philadelphia and some tape traders like myself and yourself, yeah. you know, so but, that's, but then- that's, where, that's where that influence really, really, really took off. Also, later in the year when they get the cruiserweights, which Conan brings those cruiserweights in, it was uh, Ray, Psychosis, and Tubi were the the, the big three guys that were featured in ECW in 95, later yeah. 95. So those were the guys. Now, I would say not so much the click, but when Austin goes to ECW in late 95 as superstar Steve Austin and yeah. was frustrated with WCW, that's when the Attitude Era could have hit because that Steve Austin was the same Steve Austin you were going to see one, two years later being Stone Cold Steve Austin it was the same personality, same everything. It was just presented a little bit differently and presented to a smaller audience. So yeah. that's where I was going to uh, try to go next with Steve Austin, Mick Foley. Um, yes. Yeah. And, 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 and yes, Mick, Mick was there in 94 and 95. So yes, uh, he had an influence on that, um, on that wave also, as far as attitude error went, as far as the stunt stuff, you know? Yeah. And so ECW was uh, introducing, I guess, uh, you know, the extreme revolution, these match styles that were far and away where, you know, you're, you're a pile of drivers, you're, you're finishing move and you have the click, you know, I don't think you have a WWF surviving the Monday night wars without Sean Hunter. Uh, the click. I don't think that they make it out of that. And then you have the outsiders in WCW, and then Bischoff. Um, didn't he have a relationship with somebody in Japan? I know Conan was bringing in the Luchadors, but didn't Bischoff have an in with some of the guys in Japan, or was he just getting them from ECW? Okay, so uh, WCW had a relationship with Japan, which got dis- in disrepair. That was during the Bill Wash regime. Right. That that that's where that relationship just completely soured. So that I can blame the Bill Watts regime for. However, when Bischoff came aboard, um, he, that was one of the first things he did was repair that relationship with New Japan, because he realized more than anybody that you're going to need uh, influx of talent coming in. And J- Japan had some of the greatest talent ever, you know, and they wouldn't bring in they would bring in like Muda or Chono or. Kensuke Sasaki, they would bring him once in a while, but they, they would like exchange. But what also Bischoff would do is exchange American talent back into the States. You know what I mean? So he would like um, he would he would have like stuff like that. So it, it was a back and forth kind of relationship. Yeah. Um, and um, we're um, now I'm sorry. I'm I'm total. What was the original question? <laughs> um, I was trying to see. You know, this is about the influence of ECW, and I'm trying to see the the parallels of what ECW gave to the wider wrestling world. But the click kind of had to make the mainstream wrestling world um, into a more edgier product for that right. influence to come in and be shown in the roster and the types of matches they had and so um you have sean and hunter uh, that take us and and steve austin um who take us into the attitude era and then you know the rock's going to come up you have the outsiders who go to wcw um maybe the single greatest gimmick in all of wrestling history and then we have guys ecw essentially becomes like a feeder promotion yeah. Um, and I was wondering if Eric Bischoff, I, I, I know Eric Bischoff had some type of in in Japan, but I can't remember what it was. Okay. So, and so aside right. from poaching the guys from ECW and Conan from uh, Mexico, where else I, were we seeing those guys? 
come in. I think uh, Brad Rangins was his was his connect because he knew Brad from uh, a Vern's promotion because Brad's a Minnesota guy and was trained by Vern initially. And uh, Brad Rangins had a lot of a lot to do with also training more uh, Minnesota guys to you know to eventually get in the business and go over to like say go overseas tours to Japan and stuff like that. So I think Brad may have been his in. I know Sonny Ono was his translator, but, you know, because Sonny Ono did legitimately grow up in Japan, but somehow ended up, like, down in um, Iowa, of, of all places, right? I don't know how, but somehow Bischoff and him met early, and they, they threw karate tournaments and stuff, because Bischoff legitimately did do karate yep. tournaments. So sure did. Um, that's how they met, and um, uh, that was basically Bischoff's two ins in Japan, if you want to call it that. So, um, you know, to get, the, uh, uh, I would say more, it was, I, I have to credit more Brad than, okay. than anybody, you know what I mean? Like to, as the liaison. So, you know, kind of like how Diamond Dallas Page was the liaison to get like a lot of guys that weren't under contract, like Holland Nash, for example, that weren't under con like the, WCW couldn't legally talk to him, but Diamond Dallas Page can talk to him and go back to Bischoff with this information. You know what I mean? So I think that's how Brad acted as far as the Japanese influence goes, you know, but in ECW where their Japanese influence came from was not from all Japan or new Japan. It came from FMW, you know, because FMW for all intents and purposes, Onita's promotion when Onita ran it, was the original EC like the, the original extreme championship wrestling concept was pretty much a paint by numbers version just in the states of Onita's promotion FMW when gotcha. he ran. Yes. So th- they would I would say more of stolen from that than they did and, and later on they would bring in a lot of Onita's guys like as talent exchanges. So or and then um also they were bringing a lot of Mich- Michinoku Pro guys. So, yeah. um, the they, they would, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the international part of the BWO. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we have, well, there, there's, there's the NWO invasion angle and in the WWF, uh, where Vince's back is, is really to the wall. And there are serious questions on whether or not they're going to be able to, to come out of this. I remember uh, very clear that I can't remember where I was when I watched it, but seeing Sabu jump off the the R on on the raw set by by the entrance just like blew my mind to see this little thing that I, I think I saw on my aunt's satellite TV out in Westfield like a couple times where I'd see ECW and then seeing them on the WWF was just like wow. So um what is going on with Paul and Vince and what what is Paul E telling uh the talent um around this time to get them on Monday Night Raw? Well, first of all, Paul is keeping keeping the talent in under K Fade, basically not telling them anything. Okay. And still um oh, okay, so from all accounts, the talent the, the smarter talent knew something was up between Paul and Vince. Um, it was more um, Vince. Uh, Vince always wanted, if you notice, before OVW came about, he always wanted a feeder system of some sort where they could develop talent and then basically uh, take. Now, Smoky Mountain tried this, but Smoky Mountain ran out of money. So and Jim Cornette eventually got hired by WWF. And, you know, uh, work for their creative team. So that that didn't work. Then flash forward a couple a year, year later or whatever. And ECW, uh, you know, they need help with a couple things for promotion or whatever. Money. And yeah, money. And here's Vince. And um, it was more um, my understanding. It was more Bruce and Paul, like Bruce being the liaison between Paul and Vince you know, getting, getting those meetings set up. So, um, and, uh, like, so, but Vince thought it was a good idea because, you know, Vince and and Vince wasn't okay. So supposedly Vince put him under like five, I think it was like giving him $500 a week or something like that. Supposedly. 
it was five hundred dollars a week to help out ECW. You know yeah. what I mean? Towards because he Vince knew that Paul can develop talent. He saw the talent in Paul. He knew he can develop talent, so Vince can eventually take that talent, right? Yeah. And Vince always was gracious about, if you notice, he always did, like, a talent exchange even. This was before, like, contracts were really, you know, you can't compete anywhere else except WWF. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so It was a handshake uh, deal. Right. And, and, and Vince was always very good with sending WWF talent that basically they weren't really doing anything with. The first one I remember them sending was Al Snow, where he was a great Leaf hand. Cassidy. Yeah, yeah. And he was a great hand. He had done a couple different things, but he, he just wasn't clicking. And then sends him to Paul. And then Paul develops the Al Snow with the head and the rest is history. So there you go. And uh, but but and then he he was under contract the whole time at WWF. Yeah. It, it, what, what many people don't realize. So uh, it didn't cost Paul a dime to develop him. You know, all he had to do was basically just get him ready for the main roster. So, you know, but it, it was a great trade off. Right. You know, right. ECW gets to stay afloat. Paul gets to work his creative magic. And in, in the end, both ECW and WWF get to showcase these talents. Pretty much. And, uh, you know, didn't cost him a dime. Flash forward to when OVW had both Big Show and Mark Henry down there for a piece. And, you know, they were both on, they were both still being paid by Vince, but they were helping out all the young guys down in OVW. Now, yeah. with that said, Paul Heyman did not have WWF guys setting up the ring like he did yeah. for, uh, you know, Mark Henry and Big Show. However, different story, different time. So yeah. it's, uh, but that was, if you notice, Vince always wanted a feeder system because he, Vince knew that, okay, well, all the territories are dried up. I pre he had to have known he dried them all up. I mean, that was his, that was basically his doing, you know what I mean? Yep. I, no, he could paint in any way he wants. That was his doing. Right. And it suited him well until it didn't suit him. So he couldn't find talent anymore. So going back know, to hey, that system with a promotion that is, you know, kind of local to them, you know, uh, WWF is out of New York and Connecticut, and then you have ECW um, down in Philadelphia. It was a a great exchange, I think. And when when did uh, Vince and Jerry Lawler have that little Memphis uh, thing going going on? That was a couple of years before this, right? Where Vince was like the heel invader going down there. Yeah, that was the early '90s, like '93. 93 time period and uh yeah vince vince had always on and off worked with memphis over the years you know what i mean as long as lawler or jerry jarrett who actually jerry jarrett was going to be slated to run the entire company if vince had gone to jail if he got convicted of the steroid thing so yeah you know steroid distribution so which thankfully he didn't and you know we would have seen a completely different wwf now if that had happened but um yeah, uh, it's, so they, the, Vince has always had a working relationship with like the little minor league promotions, but he would always put whenever the talent he felt was ready or one. OK, so let me rephrase that. If Vince, did, if Vince didn't think they were ready, somebody within the Vince McMahon circle would think they're ready. And then they would go up to the roster and basically sink or swim from there. Yeah. So, yeah. And ECW being no exception. Now, unlike Eric Bischoff, who would take ECW's talent, pay them a shit ton of money, and, you know, yeah, he would get some criticism for it, but they were the guys were getting paid, yeah. and they would jump, and, you know what I mean? That, that was their decision to do that. So, I mean, but Bischoff, sometimes I felt the guy, and I got unfairly blamed for that, you know what I mean? Whereas the WWF, uh, it was, it, I guess it was a little different. You know what I mean? But with I, think, I think it I would know. depend on which type of guy you are. Like most every guy who gets into the business is grew up in it. Uh, Bret Hart um, is an example. Then you have body guys like Warrior uh, Batista who 
didn't grow up with it and it isn't this huge uh you know it's it, it's a way to get paid and right. i think it would depend on uh, which kind of camp that you would fall into at this point. Paul did short some guys hundreds of thousands of dollars. And not, if, until, not until later, but yes. Yeah, yeah. But if they can just walk up to WCW, you know, they have a responsibility to themselves and to their families to to do this. This is where you get down and see that this is a business. Yeah, and to be fair, a lot in WWF back then was still in that big man mindset because – all the all the talent I mentioned, Guerrero, um, Benoit, Malenko, they all had tryouts at the time for WWF at one point or another. They all had tryouts, and uh, Benoit actually had three matches that were taped. They weren't they weren't shown on television, but they were taped. So and um, you know and he was brought in from the request of Owen Hart and Bret Hart because he had trained. Yeah, he's up. from. Yeah. The, the stampede territory and Brett even said in his book, I don't know how they passed on Benoit because he could have been, you know what I mean? Like they, that could have been the talent they needed at that point, at that period in time, that, that could have been it, but it, maybe it was a height thing. I don't know. So, um, probably was. But maybe so, <laughs> you know, like, so WWF passed on him. WCW did not pass on him. You know what I mean? And if you're getting paid X from Paul Heyman and, and Bischoff's offering you, you know, six figures guaranteed. I mean, where are you going to go? Because Paul Heyman, it was basically a handshake and he, maybe you'll get paid. Maybe you won't, you know, uh, depending on what era of ECW that was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, would, like, like there were guys like I think of um, Tommy Dreamer and like uh, the, the Dudleys. Those guys are, you know, through and through ECW talent yeah. who uh, uh, are businessmen themselves, but also love this business, love what they're able to do. And yep. you need guys like that to stick around when everybody else is, you know, kind of walking away. And so this has always been a little uh, tricky for me to uh, try to try to suss out because I can see uh, that the, uh, you know, walking over to WCW and getting all that money. That's great. But if you do have a passion for the business, if you're not just a body guy, then you know, you're going to get paid sometimes just to sit home. And so I think you have to have a good mixture of that. And towards the end of ECW, you started to see who those guys were. And a lot of guys, I'm not sure if it was psychological up here or if it was just the pep talks that Paul has given them or whatever, you know, maybe it was something else. But a lot of those guys willingly stayed and willingly didn't get paid. You know what I mean? And you can't go on blaming Paul Heyman forever for something like that. Uh, you know, you have to take accountability for that, you know, because yeah. a Paul, a Paul, uh, whether he uh, wants to take accountability or not, he knows what he did. You know what I mean? You're yeah. ultimately you're accountable for yourself as a businessman. So if that set guy, say you're uh, Benoit, you're Sandman, you're Raven, you're whoever it is, wants to go to WCW and make, you know, a pretty good living there, guaranteed money. Who are you to criticize? You know what I mean? I thought this was the wrestling business, right? right. Last day back. So, but, exactly. you know, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, ECW audience uh, sometimes does not see it that way. <laughs> so, no, no, those are uh, I, I mean, those are guys like in the audience. Like I remember, um, oh gosh, who, who were some of the the mainstays in the front row? Like Straw Hat Guy. Um, who were who were some of those guys that you saw at every every show? Hat Guy, sign, the original Sign Guy. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, there was Sign Guy Dudley later on. Yeah, spite the original sign guy, uh, you know that that's why sign guy Dudley was created. It was this, it was spite the original sign guy, right? Yeah. So, um, because what a lot of people don't know is those wrestlers freaking loathe those fans. They they did not like them. You know, they they loved them later when you know everything was starting. It, it kind of reminds me of high school, right? No, nobody talks. Everybody's in their own cliques in the beginning, and then by the end of high school, it's like. 
oh, it's sad that we all have to leave. And it's like, where were you the last three, four years when you weren't talking to me? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind or of actively that trying to make my life a living hell. Right. It's It was kind of like that vibe with the ECW fans, whereas the wrestlers did not like them at first. I mean, Mick Foley was the first one to be very vocal against the ECW fans and completely changed his style because of it. But a lot of those, the you know, some of some of the wrestlers play, uh, you know, they 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 placated to those fans. But and for I mean, the longest yeah. time, those fans paid the bills for those wrestlers. Right. So you had the the hat guy, you had um, uh, the sign guy, you had the Howard Stern looking guy, you had the uh, you had Dreads. Uh, Dreads was like kind of the guy that was over in the this row over here, you know, like in the front. You had uh, young Mike Johnson. Uh, PW Insider, Mike Johnson, as as oh. the fan going there. If you go back and watch footage, he's got long hair, but he's he's in the front row for every show. So uh, you have a young Mike Johnson. You have um, uh, you have uh, Charlie from uh, you know the Charlie the uh, the WrestleMania guy. Basically, he went to the guy that went to every WrestleMania. Yeah. Uh, you, you had him. But he's he's a, he's the second most recognizable fan next to Vladimir. He's playing. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, but but him and Vladimir were were in our friends, and they they been to every WrestleMania together. So it's yeah. You know, it was one of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but yeah, Charlie was always in the crowd. Um, uh, so- you had um, uh, you had you had a ton of. You just had a ton of fans there that there were regulars, and uh, but those are the ones that stick out immediately. Yeah. So, going on from the WWF invasion angle, uh, when do we see ECW getting its own show on a prime cable station? All right. So let's go back just a piece, uh, real quick. So we talked about the invasion angle was in that late 96, early 97. And the invasion angle was a deal between Paul Vince, you know, to basically promote their first pay-per-view, uh, which was barely legal. And of course, that's when the mass transit incident happened with New Jack. And that kind of, it almost canceled the pay-per-view, but, yeah. you know, instead they put it on a later time slot thinking you know and they still did a respectable number given the late later time slot but um they you know all of that was to promote that show if you notice and if you look at that show that was the first ecw show that was really well lit that that arena just would look clean for once i've been to that arena it's not very clean well it's clean now it wasn't back then so um <laughs> but um yeah it was uh because they used a special lighting that wwf used you know, so they have that. And then um, they, they were basically off and running from there where they get the Nash. They, they get the television deal. Now, as I mentioned before, they were on syndication. The hardcore TV was on. And by this time, they were on Madison Square Garden Network, but they were also on the Sunshine Network and they were on uh, Sports Channel. So the, they were on those three at at the same time and whatever other oddball syndications would carry them at like some oddball time right because yeah. you, you hear stories about people discovering it at like three in the morning uh, you know on this channel wherever yeah. in this part of the united states you know what i mean so yeah, I, I remember accidentally seeing it on my my aunt who lived in in westfield with all those abandoned houses that my own little private ghost down there um, there was no cable being run out there and so she had one of the earliest forms of satellite and I remember accidentally seeing ECW, one of the 1300 channels, real late one night. And that was my first introduction to it. I couldn't tell you what channel that is now, but. Right. And um, I remember seeing a lot of it, like if I took vacations to Florida, it would be the Sunshine Network, you know, uh, which later the Sunshine Network would play the uh, MLW tapings, uh, uh, the early court hour MLW tapings before. MLW basically ceased to exist and then came back a few years ago. So this was early 2004. But um, yeah, but they they get the national deal around 1999. Uh, You know, we find out at Heat Wave that uh, Heat Wave 99 is when that TNN deal is finally struck. And um, they they put them on. I I remember they put them on on Friday nights at like eight or nine o'clock. 
and that was like the worst time slot you could put them on because who the heck is home on Friday night at eight or nine o'clock? And it was only on an hour. Yeah. So like it was just a it was a different it was a different show then by by that time. And um by the time the first episode aired, that's when Taz and the Dudleys made the deals to go to WWF and decided to leave. So well Taz stuck around a little while, but the Dudleys did not. So yeah, they were almost gone immediately. Well, uh, when do you know when exactly Paul got the the TNN deal and like how much time there was for him to prepare to transition to that? And I need just just one minute. Sorry. Yep. So sorry. So no, okay. when does Paul secure the TV deal for uh, TNN and how much time does he have to start getting ready uh, for that uh, for the next and what will be the last stand for ECW? Uh, now, from all accounts, I heard. OK, so going back a little bit. Um, Johnny Grunge had come out in an interview, I believe it was on the Forever Hardcore documentary, and said he had heard that bullshit about, like, back when the public enemy were in ECW, about, like, getting a national television deal and figures and this whole ball of wax. So Paul had had it, you know, percolating in his brain, like, in 95, 6, 7 time period. Finally, in 1999, they strike a deal. Um, I want to say around like uh, springtime, they they strike a deal. Um, finally, with 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 uh, the TNN talks were were happening. Let's just say, yeah. and um, which may, which would make a whole lot of sense because if you think about it, uh, in April they did the test pilot for SmackDown, which uh, happened in April of '99 as well for UPN. So wrestling was in 1999. Wrestling was still hot and popping even wcw was getting like 2.5 to 3.0 ratings still at that time so yeah. and they were producing a garbage show <laughs> so well, you know by that point but it, was, it wasn't the numbers that it would become you know but it was but but what i'm saying is wrestling was at such a hot peak there that anybody was signing like if you just saw the name wrestling in 1999 they were they were just signing checks they meaning television networks so it could have been earlier but i i'm willing to believe it was like march april kind of time period and they of course didn't premiere until july of 1999 yeah. and their premiere was not a well it was basically a clip show because paul refused to use the truck that 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 tnn sent he refused to tape a brand new show you know uh there was half there was a half crowd in this this particular tv taping it didn't look good for any sort of television you know what i mean it made them look less so yeah. that's why paul decided to make the move on doing a clip show as opposed to doing a live show for his first show so and then of course the clip show ended with all the guys that taz beat and then you know, from all the major promotions that were already all signed. And then they interviewed Taz, you know, saying, oh, it's, you know, uh, ECW and TNN and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, 99, uh, July, August 99 were, was like when the premiere date was. And um, that show was not a very good show. By that point, they had jumped the shark because they had Taz and the Dudleys at that time and then you figure out like two not even a week after they get the deal 
they're gone. They're they're already starting to talk with WWF at that time. Yeah. Uh, Raven comes back. Sandman comes back probably a month later, but it was not the same ECW as it was in 96, 97, 98, even 1995. You know, it was not the same promotion yeah. at all. So, and meanwhile, they were still running hardcore TV as well. So they were, they, yeah, and and they were paying to be on there, so that was eating their lunch as well. Um, but they were they got so much money in advance for you know the figure deal, the the video game deal that came about through a plane, uh, the television deal that came about that it was okay for a while, but until it wasn't okay, and then all the money was spent. So, yeah. yeah. I know I've seen that interview with Vince tons of times where he said he's talking with Paul about this and he's and Vince is trying to pass on some wisdom like, hey, this is great, but now you have to change to appeal to a wider audience. And at that point, if ECW does that, it's no longer ECW. And it's I don't think it would have made it anyway i don't think ecw could have ever been anything more than what it was and that's been and that being that's a good point because like i had just said in the previous sentence where they sent the truck that paul refused to use with tnn crew aboard you know kind of like how turner had the turner sports crew with nitro yeah. you know as their cameraman um for for the most part but um you know jackie crockett and uh, david crockett still ran for Okay. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Welcome back. Yeah, yeah. No, for some reason, uh, some somebody called my phone and it puts my whole phone on hold instead of just. Wait. But okay. So getting back to what I was saying, because you could probably edit this out. So, like I was saying in the previous sentence, Paul had, Paul had a truck he didn't he refused to use that was sent by TNN. Half half of the crowd was there. It was not a very good looking television show. So. Um, it was basically going to be Paul Heyman's way or no way. You know what I mean? Even with that pep talk from Vince, he wasn't about to change. So, Because he made it to where he was by not being what Vince and Bischoff were. Right. And, and it was not, and by 1999, it was not the same business as it was in 1997. 1997 yeah. just took off like gangbusters for every promotion that had professional wrestling attached to it. So yeah. by 1999, you, everybody, and, and this is full-fledged into the Attitude Era, full-fledged WCW has already jumped the shark about three times with the NWO. You know what yeah. I mean? So we're, we're now on NWO tie-dye at this point, okay? <laughs> no bullshit. So, um, so, so, um, literally it is a completely different wrestling business by 1999 while you're while if it says professional wrestling you're going to get signed that doesn't mean you know you're going to come off looking like wwf light or wcw light do you understand that does that make sense yes yeah, it sure does oh so, especially if you're ecw and you're only at any point i don't think they packed more than I think their biggest crowd might have been either Asbury Park for Living Dangerously 98 or it might have been for uh, the November to Remember 97 in uh, uh, Manaka there, Pennsylvania, Mm -hmm. So, which is right outside of Pittsburgh. I think that that was probably the most people they ever drew, which was, I think, like 4,000 some odd fans and 5,000 some odd fans, respectively. You know, otherwise they were they were like a twelve hundred. The 2000 fan type of promotion they were not a 20,000 seater like a wwf was yeah. or no. wcw at its peak you know uh even wcw when it wasn't at its peak was still doing 10 15,000 people per night so and it is an interesting um look because you have guys on the new ecw show the last ecw show that have been on been on on uh, WCW on WWF programming, um, yep. but who by then like like Raven was gone from ECW right at this time he was in WCW still 
He was in. Okay, so when uh, TNM began, when they got signed, he wasn't there. Well, after after um, they ran the initial couple shows, he was there because that okay. was one of the big surprises. He came back when the Dudleys were leaving. He came back to ECW. This was August of '99. Raven had walked out of WCW, being unhappy. Raven walked out. Uh, Shane Douglas walked out. Conan walked out. Um, uh, you know, a whole list of other guys walked out due to being disgruntled. Of course, Shane Douglas and Conan went back to work for WCW. They, you know what I mean? They had, they, they yeah. couldn't technically work anywhere else. Yeah. And then that would lead later into the revolution there, walking out onto WWF television, becoming the radicals. So, um, way different. That's a different story for a different time. But again, that would lead into a lot of things. And um, like I said, by August of 99, Raven was was back in ECW, but it was not the same Raven. This was, uh, you know, he was he wasn't influential anymore like yeah. he was in 1995, 1996, 1997. He was just he was an established name Raven just coming back from WCW. Sandman, yeah. same thing. It wasn't it was not the same when Sandman came back after losing all the weight and doing, you know, doing the roids and looking better than he ever looked. But he looked great. Yeah. It, it just wasn't the same Sandman. It wasn't, it wasn't the Sandman that, that was in ECW that everybody loved. So it was really different by 1999, you know, but, and then I, I also in the interim, they, they, from FMW, they get, they lure Mike Awesome back to the States with a big contract, which Paul Heyman could not fulfill. So, that leads to Mike Awesome basically jumping the WCW and WCW offering him a huge signing bonus, which the signing bonus essentially was his contract payout from ECW when you think yeah. about it. And so, that's where ECW always came up short. You may have a national stage now for your guys to play on, but they've for years ecw has essentially been a feeder territory and now that you're playing with you know national money on a national stage i yep. just i i don't i mean they, they weren't even on for like they were on for for barely a year on tnn right yeah and um that deal you okay and they were right they meaning paul and tommy you know in interviews saying that you never saw a commercial for ECW. You never saw anything advertised unless ECW was on. That is the hundred percent the truth. Yeah. Uh, unless they were advertising like, okay, ECW's on here, and then Roller Jam is on underneath, you know, yeah. after ECW and other whatever other freaking shows that they seemed to merge together because it was TNN at the time. It was, uh, and um, by all accounts, that was um. To see, uh, what was it? It was to see if wrestling tested on TNN. So that way, when WWF's contract was up, that WWF can come in and get a giant contract and a giant television rights deal through TNN. And they did. And they did. And that did. Then that happened. And they, and they got probably some of the highest ratings right out of the gate due to, and these ratings slaughtered ECW's rating. ECW on TNN because they were on such a shitty time slot, we're getting like kind of like AEW numbers now. You know what I mean? Like yeah. for for like a weekly AEW number was what ECW was was getting on Friday nights. And I'm convinced if they put them on a better slot, they probably would have done better, I think. But yeah. Horse was already out of the barn by that point. So yeah. and so I've seen um, the rise and fall of BCW and forever hardcore. Uh, Paul talks about this time um, without the TV spot. Um, that's there is no more ECW. And, well, that, and he says that because he was so backed up against the wall and owed so much money. Rob Peter to pay Paul, pun intended, all of it. Uh, <laughs> Year after, because he was spending money year after year after year to try to keep this company afloat. Because think about it, guys, he had guys under six-figure contracts that, you know, and this was an indie group. 
Yeah. Think about it. He had at one point he had Raven under a six figure contract. Keep in mind it was a low six figures, but still six figures nonetheless. He had Sandman under a six figure contract. He had Shane under a six figure contract. He had Bam Bam under a six figure contract. He had Candido under a six figure contract. So I'm just saying, just wrestler salaries alone, like would have completely bankrupted the company. Never mind yeah. everything else that had happened. You know what I mean? No matter how many shows you were gonna run. And ECW was running a lot of shows. You were never going to make up what they owed. They just owed yeah. way too much. And they got themselves so back against the wall. So maybe, I'm just analyzing here, maybe even Paul saying that it was because Paul was saying that because maybe that big influx of cash can finally smooth things over with everyone. You know what I mean? Like if they got like, say, a $50 million deal or something ridiculous, they can they can get out of debt. and you know, finally move yeah, they, forward. Yeah, they can never, finally yeah, they can finally get their head above water. And if it didn't work on that TNN deal, it just there there was nothing else that they could have done. You know, all all, all that debt is still there. Um all all of these financial obligations are are still there and you do have a show on a network that doesn't care if the show is on there. I think yeah. that's the truth as well. Yeah. Like, they, like, they signed it, um, you know, and again, I mean, if if uh, if Vince McMahon and uh, Bruce Pritchard had the inside track on, you know, and they were supposedly, you know, in with Paul, wouldn't you let Paul know that, hey, you know, like th- this company is poaching us to kind of, you know, th- there was never a gentleman's agreement there either, you know, if you notice. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of like ECW got kicked off and then well, WWF yeah. just moved, moved its way in, you know, without any, you know, whatever. Well, so. in like 99 was a better year for the WWF. But like if I'm Vince McMahon and I have this guy that I like, I respect, think he's great. But if I need to keep my ship afloat after it almost sinking just a year and a half ago, sorry. Like that's it's that's not personal. That that is just where it is, you know, where, where business is business. This promotion has to make money. Yeah. So the, wherever sadly, you can go to get the most money is where you need to bring someone. And sadly, it was at the expense of Paul, who, you know, here here's the irony of the whole thing was Vince brought you know Paul in to kind of it, it was like I help you, you help me kind of kind of vibe. And then when it happens to be oh, wait a minute, we're going to end up getting this $100 million deal on TNN and you're going to get booted, you know, and it was all for nothing that whole year. Yeah. And then what? You know, like, there's no gentleman's agreement. That's when it. That's when the wrestling business becomes the wrestling business right there yep. on a cutthroat level. Yeah. So, because ultimately, I... ultimately Vince is going to get the upper hand regardless, you know. So, ECW uh, goes off um, TNN in 2000. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, in, in, in the late 2000s. Yeah, because they stayed on for a little bit longer while WWF had premiered on TNN already. So, they were still on for a little bit, but they... Not for very long, and um, uh, they get booted off. They're back on hardcore TV, but they can't afford, by this point, ECW is in such financial shambles, they can't even afford to run hardcore TV. So they're just simply running house shows, surviving on fumes, selling out those set house shows everywhere they go, but they're, they're basically on fumes at this point. So, and uh, we're, we're talking... None of the money went into the wrestlers' pockets. They were all, it was all going to the company's pockets to try to even just keep the company afloat. So nobody was getting paid. And yeah. according to Paul, Paul wasn't even getting paid. Yeah. And I like, I don't ever really side with uh, businessmen who are screwing out the people they're supposed to be paying. But if Paul doesn't do that, nobody's ever going to get paid. Right. And, and I think a lot of the guys into 
a lot of the guys maybe stuck with Paul because they knew he had a WWF connection by that point, and they knew the company was basically a lot of the like I said, a lot of the smarter guys knew the company was basically in trouble in '99. You know, like after they signed the TNN deal, so maybe they were holding on in hopes that they thought Paul can get them in the WWF. And with some guys that happened, with other guys it did not happen. So uh, guys and girls, it did not happen. So um, yeah. that that part never came about. Yeah. And yeah, I know it's a tragic. And then when does Vince? Well, so ECW or Paul? I'm not sure what the uh, business structure was, but. Um, they filed bankruptcy. I think there were some guys that were able to sue him or the company in bankruptcy to get some money um, that mm-hmm. they were they were owed. I, don't know, I haven't looked into that in a while, but when when is when do we see the door shut on an ECW show for the last time? Do you know? All right, I got it right here. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> All right. These two fan cams right here, these Pine Bluff, Arkansas, were the last two ECW, original ECW shows. And, uh, yeah, so these were, um, it says January 12th, January 13th of 2001. Now, keep in mind by this point, on the other side of the coin, wrestling-wise, you had Bischoff, who was trying to get Fusion Ventures to buy WCW, and Bischoff was going to essentially take it to Vegas and run yeah. it uh and run it basically that was going to be their headquarters all like a like a tna basically they were going to have a home headquarters and when they got established then they were going to start to run which is actually a more sound business plan so but yeah. um he was he got he got financial backers that deal fell through because um jamie keller came in and said, said hey nope you, no more tv everything no more tv we're not we're not we're not featuring wrestling on tv anymore so uh Fusion pulled out of the deal due to that because they only wanted it because they wanted the television slots in the first place. So they pulled out of it. Then swoops in and buys it for a bargain basement price. A couple you know, million dollars, I think. Yeah, considering how much he he is freaking made on WCW's name and merchandising and likenesses for everyone and all that. Uh the, man, he got a steal of a lifetime with that. I do so, know that when the, when Hall and Nash first show up and Hall is still using the accent, you know, they're building this as, hey, we're Vince's guys here. And there becomes a, a really interesting legal battle. Part of the agreement where they settled out of court, <clears throat> and this was, you know, at, at the time in, you know, 96, 97, you know, it didn't really mean anything, but Vince got first rights to I believe part of the tape library for WCW in the event that WCW goes out of business. There are these a yeah, couple year old, really weird uh, legal uh, uh, negotiations that were wedged into that deal. Um, because then when Vince said that Razor Ramon and Diesel are coming back, WCW sued him for that saying, no, 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 you can't. Uh, start trying to advertise our guys. I just know that part of the uh, settlement was that Vince got first rights for, I think, an absurd amount of money to uh, yeah, WCW gimmicks and WCW uh, in their, their tape library. And so it, mm. it, it like I, I think that's part of the reason he was able to get away with it for such uh, a low amount. Well, if that's if if that's the case, I mean, shit, that's. Uh, thank, thank Jerry McDivitt for that yeah. one. My God, yeah, yeah, because so, it's just he here. Keep, yeah, he couldn't keep the pandas off his back, but my <laughs> God, he, yeah, I know Woo! it was just these hail mary legal clauses in a, uh, you know, in, in in a lawsuit that you know it meant nothing at the time, but it's just yeah, you know, McDivitt's like, hey, if if, if things go our way down the road, this will help us out, and boy, did it. Um, yeah, yeah. So ECW closes its doors at uh, the beginning of 2001. Yep. And 
the the last thing I want to touch on before we kind of go back and discuss our um, personal uh, ideas about the the influence of ECW, uh, Paul Heyman, or or any of the guys that came out of their head in the business. Um, Vince buys ECW. Yep. And so he so he thinks. What do you mean? Meaning, okay, so. You remember how I was telling you they had deals with Acclaim, they had deals with uh, all these different companies, well, Feinstein being one of them because he was their videographer and uh, distributor for a lot of years. Also, there was a guy named Steve Carell who uh, came in and was uh, also involved somehow in, in the financials. So ECW had kind of sold part, Paul had sold parts of the company off here and there to different people at various points and that was another reason why he got into money troubles was was because of that yeah. and i mean thank god billy corgan was smart enough to actually see that don't get involved in that you know because they, he tried selling billy corgan you know a piece of ecw and billy corgan said no i'm not yeah. i'm not doing that so um yeah. and that would that that mindset would also serve him well with tna before he uh buys the nwa um years later but Right, right, where he put money in TNA, and TNA said, no, you did not put money into it, and he said, yes, I did, and I have the proof, and, yeah. you know, he eventually won the lawsuit. He won the day, but, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, the last dying ember of ECW, oh, go ahead. No, so I was going to say, Vince buying ECW outright um, was not as easy uh, at first as people thought it was. Um, now he did eventually buy the assets out once it completely went into bankruptcy, but he, you know, it took a little while before he could start really utilizing and monetizing the ECW brand. So he, uh, you know, and thankfully he got his stuff together right before uh, the invasion angle happened. So yeah. otherwise they wouldn't have been able to use it. Well, and when do we see, WWECW, where you have uh, the Silver World Title, which on its own was, I know, different. But you know, you see Christian and Bobby Lashley, and it's like you know, and then Vince is the ECW champion. Um, when did WWE run that offshoot uh, third brand on on their show? Um. Well, okay, so. 2004, The Rise and Fall of ECW comes out. It's one of their highest selling DVDs. And Van Dam, Rob Van Dam, comes up with the idea, let's do a one-off ECW show because of the popularity of the DVD sales. Yeah. That's been documented to death. Everyone knows it. One Night Stand happens. Great show. They, they utilized the best of what they had with what, who they had under contract for WWE at the time. Also brought back the old school ECW originals. And it was a it was a fabulous show. It was well produced. It was. it was a great show from beginning to end. It hit all the nostalgic feels and the buy rate showed because it almost hit WrestleMania levels at buy rate. So they thought they meaning WWE thought, hey, well, if it worked one year, it can work another year. Meanwhile, in the interim, Paul Heyman being back with the company in some capacity because during that interim, right before the or right after the one night stand is when Paul gets sent down to OBW, right? After Cornette gets fired from OBW, Paul gets sent down there to do. Was that when work. he beat up Santino? That was kind of the final straw. Yeah. Uh, okay. He slapped him. He basically just paintbrushed him. Yeah. In the back. But that was like final, final, final straw for, okay. you know, because Cornette's done tons of stuff where he's blown up at various wrestlers <laughs> that that just happened to be the coup de gras so gotcha. and they wanted to get rid of him anyway so they meaning wwe so paul enters down there and of course that's when he starts writing for uh you know and cm punk gets down there at the same time and that's when he starts writing a lot for punk but he's also developing other talent down there your beth phoenix's your bobby lashley's all these other influx of guys that, that come onto the main roster soon enough, right? Flash forward to summer of 2006. Paul is back up on the roster again. 
and you know here we here's WWE they want to revise this brand and Rob Van Dam has the money in the bank he wins it that year and says I'm going after the WWE title well this happens to coincide with the second one night stand which is very much a WWE produced show in comparison to the first but it was all a vehicle to make Rob Van Dam the world heavyweight champion both in ECW, both in WWE. He was a double champion for about two weeks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so so this comes in 06. Uh, in the meantime, Shane McMahon was a big fan of the original ECW and thought the brand had some value. At first, they wanted to make it an online uh, only uh, show, which would have been awful in 2006. But, you know, like yeah. given given the limitations of how the internet was still back then in 2006. Finally, sanity prevailed and Vince McMahon said, oh, God damn it, we can sell this. Let's see what network is under our USA umbrella that can carry this. And for some reason, sci-fi won. So yeah. <laughs> sci-fi ended up carrying ECW. And um, they, they got a way better, uh, eh, I wouldn't say it was a way better time slot, but it was a slightly better time slot than what they had before. And um, it was on, yeah, it was, it was it was still on Tuesdays, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They would tape. They would um, that would be live before SmackDown would be taped. So yeah. they, they kind of had like they had a separate entrance and the separate ring skirts and all that stuff. So yeah. it wasn't a bad time slot. It just and and the talent wasn't half bad because in the meantime they were signing ECW originals that they thought they still had value and still could go. And they had an influx of the OVW guys that Paul Heyman was already writing for down in 2005 and early 2006 before he gets brought back up to the main roster. So at first, it had all the makings of the original ECW concept where you have the established vets here. You had the guys here and girls here that were being developed in the developmental brand that were starting to become ready for primetime TV. And then eventually they would go to either Raw or SmackDown instead of going to WWF, WCW. So the concept was completely there as far as a feeder kind yeah. of system, right? Yeah. And very slowly and very surely, actually, no, very fast, it became a WWE-type product. You know, when you see Ric Flair in the main event of an ECW show versus the big show, that's when it's not ECW anymore. So, yeah. Yeah, so eventually... It just becomes like anything else in the WWE F that you start with a great idea. See your shotgun Saturday night. We're going to produce it an ECW style show in nightclubs. And then eventually it just becomes a part of your show. Sunday night heat, same thing. It's going to be first yeah. run programming. And then all of a sudden it's just an afterthought that's on MTV, you know, yep. or wherever it airs. So that's, that's just the way it ended up being. And, uh, but it wasn't all bad because a lot of talent did spawn from that original EC, that, that WWE CW, you know what I mean? That did eventually go up to the main roster and yeah. did some things. So, yeah. I mean, that's like an NXT a decade before, you know, you, you have NXT in a way like that. That's the, the early uh, uh, idea of what they wanted to do with it um, that they were kind of testing out at the time. Yeah, and ironically, the first version of NXT uh, actually replaced ECW when that went off. Uh, finally, when when they they had they they decided to just basically go black with ECW, NXT the original format replaced it. The so, game show, right? Yeah, well, that was more of the game show type. Yes, with yeah. the with the pros and the the rookies. Yes. Yeah. All that all that hijinks. Yeah. And at the end of the day, Vince is still the only one standing <laughs> at the end of all these different uh, like wars they, with promotions, promoters. It's like being at the casino. The house always wins, right? Yep. <laughs> so, Vince is the house. It's easy. It's the one that always wins, no matter yep. what. All right. Um, in your uh, opinion, what is the... Is there one guy that is an ECW talent or was cultivated to become who they were in ECW that had uh, the most influence on 
the business as a whole? Like who was who came out of ECW and did the most with that, in your opinion? The ones that were developed in ECW, I would have to say, honestly, the most successful would have to be the Dudley Boys through and through, um, because they were so successful in ECW as heels. Then they came up to the WWF and started as heels, but became something else during that jaded attitude era where they were they were presented as a, a straight babyface team, you know, like the whole get the tables thing got over and it WWF sure did. It got the WWF marketing machine got right behind them and they became very much the success that they they thought they saw themselves as in ECW. They just took it and embellished it in WWF slash WWE. They had a hell of a career. Um, understated, Taz, uh, wh- whereas his wrestling career may have gone bust after like 2001 or two time period, but as a commentator, he comes into his own and he becomes one of the more successful commentators to this day on AEW. Yep. You know, he's now a commentator slash manager whenever he wants to be a manager, you know. And they've even brought him back the FTW title. So. I know. I remember seeing that one day on like a news story. And it's like uh, Taz is stable in ECW. I had no idea that they were doing something with that. that yeah. Pretty- well, and after WWE, he, he was in TNA for many years on their commentary team and part of the Aces and Eights and all that, that stuff. So he, he Taz is in his own way. He's a big success, in my opinion. Uh, because yeah. he still he still has a job within the wrestling industry. Yeah. He's still relevant to this day. And he's, you know, he may not be Taz of 1995, 6, 7, 8, but he's he's still, his name's out there. Everyone knows who he is. So it's Well, and, and he was running the point. ECW wrestling school for its uh, short little um, existence back in the, the mid to late 90s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was uh, House of Hardcore. It was him uh, and uh, Perry Saturn. And um, they, they uh, and, and I believe um, the Dudleys, well, Bubba said he retrained in the House of Hardcore under okay. Taz. So, so that makes, and because uh, he wasn't, because Bubba always claimed he wasn't trained properly, but, you know, from his original trainer. So he did that. Uh, Chris Chetty came out of there. Nova came out. Well, Nova was an Iron Mike Sharp student, but he kind of, you know what I mean? Like it, it was, it was a lot of the second wave of ECW guys. Um, was Mikey Whip? Rob Van Dam Mark? did pretty good. Yes, I was about to mention Van Dam. Van Dam's still relevant to this day, and uh, I would say on a main event level, he probably as a singles wrestler probably the most successful ECW ever had, yeah. I would say, by, by a mile. Because uh, there was a point in 2002 to about 2004 time period where Rob Van Dam was really in the top ranking and was a contender. So yeah. it's within WWF. And you couldn't fake those crowd cheers. It, he always got the pop. He always got the cheers. Always sold merchandise. And he was very marketable. You yeah. know, just by, just by being him. Yeah, so he really was uh, uh, Mr. ECW for a little while. Um, I know Tommy Dreamer had um, a lot of backstage jobs with WWE up until recently. And, and to this day, he still has backstage jobs. Uh, I believe he's worked. Well, he got removed for a brief piece with Impact, but I think now all that whole Ric Flair uh, plane ride from hell story is kind of blown over, which why people were surprised that that story came out now and they're uh, outraged by it. It's been out there for 20 years. Everyone yeah. knows about it. It's like the Montreal screw job. Everyone knows about it, you know, like, so yeah, it's not saying that it was okay, but we're, we're reviewing history <clears throat> right. a long well, first time all, ago. Okay. Like it... Two things, two things. Not the first time Ric Flair has waved his dick at a stranger. A B also, not the first time Goldust has been drunk and singing country tunes. Yeah. Just say. <laughs> so, so uh, again, I mean, you know, and, and now both Flair and Gold and Dustin are at, at different places in their lives and aren't that way. Well, eh, Flair's still still kind of a partier at seventy three yeah, or whatever. He, but he's getting ready to have his ninetieth last match. 
Yes, but my point being is Flair doesn't walk into a bar with a row bomb with nothing underneath anymore. That's yeah. The 1980s. So it's it isn't even the 1990s anymore. He doesn't do that. So <laughs> so aside from the wrestlers, what do you think was the biggest contribution that ECW as either a promotion or an entity or as a uh, revolution was? If, 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 if there is there anything that you can put your finger on and say, this is solely because of ECW and they changed the business because of it? Um, I would say presentation. Where uh, presentation in the sense that your intelligent your 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 intelligence was not insulted by you know um, because we all know this is pro wrestling we all know this is a performance art you know what I mean we know this is not real it's not UFC it's not NFL it's not MLB even so uh, but how to present it seriously but. At the same time, not have your intelligence insulted, but at the same time, keep it pro wrestling. You know, the ridiculousness of pro wrestling and the wacky world of pro wrestling. It's such a hard thing to do. And ECW did it. And they kind of, I would say them more than anybody more uh, was in tune with contemporizing uh, pro wrestling. Like, you know, with, with the you know, using the right music for the right people, uh, the right presentation for the right person, um, uh, getting you to believe, uh, which was one of the, uh, um, the geniuses of Paul Heyman's booking, in my opinion, it was getting you to believe that these characters can be here. You know what I mean? And Sandman was really blind outside the ring. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was one of my favorites and, uh, I I loved uh, I didn't love the Sandman for his wrestling prowess, even though go to find out later he had to unlearn all that stuff to be that character. You know what I mean? Like he very much was an athlete and could wrestle when he wanted to. He just chose not to because that wasn't his character. So yeah. which was smart because he got over by being the Sandman. I mean, if you wanted to watch all the athletic stuff, I mean. Look at Rob Van Dam. The influence with Rob Van Dam, for better or worse, is there in today's wrestling. Because oh yeah, people Him. called Van Dam a spot monkey back then. But really, who isn't doing what Van Dam has done twenty years ago, twenty five years ago? Everybody is now. It's and they're sense. and they're at at best half as cool as he was doing it. Half the size too, because Van Dam was no small man. Yeah. So he was doing all those things, and he was what a good like 250 pounds easy or yeah. 245 pounds you know yeah he, he but, isn't five foot eight he's six one six and, two eight, and you so. even you even look at a guy like uh two cold scorpio which wasn't he was not a small man either and he's executing those uh 450s like they were going out of style and he was a big part of what you see today um yeah. you know as far as wrestlers doing what they do um, except he was a much bigger man, you know, yeah. uh, John think, Cronin, same thing. So, yeah, I was thinking, uh, Sabu, Taz, Van Dam, um, and but like them and like the Sandman and Tommy Dreamer and, and Raven, like the core members of like hardcore ECW, um, it, it probably them like it, I, I got this barbed wire tattoo on my forearm when I was 16 because Raven had it. Tim did yeah. the same thing with his, uh, his shoulder one. Like that was the influence. That was how deeply I connected with those and characters. He the, and Raven, he was one of the first alternative characters there was in wrestling, you know, pre rad Radford, pre, you know, pre anybody. He was, he was the guy and it was believable because of the performer portraying. And, Raven was more of a story. He was probably one of the better storytellers in ECW, I felt, who can carry an arc out. You know what I mean? Because he was just that creative. Him and Paul together were very much that creative. Um, Mm. Sabu, I don't think, you know, besides Sabu not being able to do a promo, I don't think anybody could have touched Sabu. And for what he represented in 1993, 4, and 5, 
going forward because again a lot of his influence is in today's wrestling you know for better or worse it's there you know what i mean and yeah uh, sabu was doing a lot of those a lot of the stuff you see today he was doing back then so yeah. you know it's um and but sabu can also wrestle so which was very important and can tell a story in the ring uh taz you know being the suplex guy same thing he was yeah. uh, we, we had tazplex city long before we had suplex city right steiner brothers had it first taz carried it on but taz is that bridge between the steiner brothers and you know your your kurt angles which would lead to your brock lesnar's later so it's yeah. um yeah and even so. like chris benoit in uh some sense as well yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Benoit, Malenko, Guerrero. I mean, Guerrero, Christ, you know, Guerrero was one of the greatest wrestlers to ever live yep. and um, more than proved himself. He's, he, again, another one that was on that upper echelon list. So, yeah. all right. Closing thoughts? Um, sh- closing thoughts? Uh, just that ECW, um, like my like yourself, my, I mean, the, the influence just it's still there today it's it'll always be there um it would be one of the last periods where um it was probably one of the last true outlaw promotions there was really in 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 all reality it was and um i mean what else is there to say really i mean (laughs) that hasn't been said already um looking into the late 90s when um, Stone Cold, uh, The Rock, and Degeneration X, and the NWO would uh, kind of inject pro wrestling into uh, popular culture at the time. I think, on a smaller level, sure, but I think ECW was the first promotion, the first brand that did that. You know, you, you could, uh, they were very. And on the face of it, just kind of hostile towards, you know, like WCW fans and WWF fans. It's like, we are hardcore. We are part of the revolution. You know, you could wear an ECW shirt and get a much different reaction out of somebody um, as opposed to if you were wearing uh, Shawn Michaels shirt or um, things like that. And so I think ECW was the first bridge uh, for wrestling to go into popular culture where it's still is around today. Yeah, very well said. And uh, I mean, again, I mean, I said something similar to that, and it's yeah. true. I mean, you know, it really leaves a lasting impression on you when you watch those shows. So, awesome. yeah. 